Welcome everyone. Today I'd like to introduce my course on early Greek philosophy, which will start on Saturday, February 6th and run for four weeks, for four Saturdays to be specific. I'll introduce the course a bit and then also talk you through and how to enroll if you're interested, how you can send me a message. There will be a link just down below to my website to the Helkion Guild, where you can just fill in the form and then you get the syllabus and all details on enrollment and the course fee. The course itself will focus in four focused seminars on the following so-called pre-Socratic philosophers. I prefer the term early Greek philosopher rather than pre-Socratics. Uh, Hegel, by the way, spoke of pre-Aristotelian philosophy, which both of which sometimes seem almost a bit uh, derogatory. Um, because it is with these thinkers that we'll consider that what we now call the Western tradition of philosophy really begins, but not just some tradition, but we could say that thinking itself comes into its own and arises out of mythos, moves into logos. And this begins really with the Thales and Anaximander. So those will be the two figures which we'll focus on, mostly Anaximander in the first seminar. The second seminar then will be on Parmenides, the philosopher of being, and the third seminar on Empedocles, and the fourth seminar on Heraclitus. And the course is entitled Arche, the origin of thinking. Arche means we still have the word arch or the arch of Noah, for example, means origin, but it means also um, that which is the most original and out of that which something arises. So one of the things that you learn also in the course, even if you have no knowledge yet of ancient Greek terms or the ancient Greek language, you will certainly uh, go away and know some of the most important terms like physis, logos, ache, dike, and be able to translate those in your respective mother tongues, but also not just to translate, but to think through these terms. Now with Thales, something crucial happens, which in all brevity, it's not a science. Sometimes it's claimed that this is a scientific view. It's a, that because he says everything, all is water. It's not scientific because it's not a hypothesis. He's not trying to prove anything. He's not trying to prove that um, water is in fact earth and earth in fact is somehow air, etc. He's not talking about elements in any sense, but the notion that all is water is to our knowledge, the earliest and highest abstraction. It is the earliest articulation, as far as we know, of the one statement or thought that's driving all of Western thinking, which is the notion that all is one and one is all. And the one thinker who will articulate this explicitly is Heraclitus, who said, for example, Uk emu alatulugu akusantas homologain sophonestin hen panta enai. Not to me, but to the Logos having listened, it is wise to say that one is many, or that one is all, hen panta enai. Hen is one, panta is all, enai is to be. So, and by the way, this is exactly what German idealism will think through. All three thinkers, Schelling, Hegel, Hölderlin, in different ways, and will come to different results thinking through this profound thought. But when um, Schelling, Hölderlin, and Hegel were roommates in Tübingen, Hölderlin wrote into Hegel's diary into his Stammbuch, Hen Kaipan, one and many. And this sets off 
this movement. So this is a, also a preparatory course for anyone or foundational for anyone interested in Kant and German idealism. With so Thales is is this is what we'll focus on in Thales, and we will read Aristotle's Metaphysics, uh, Book One on Thales here. But we will also read uh, John Burnett's Early Greek Philosophy. It's a classical book on these early thinkers. It's one of the best books I think in the English language. I think it's about a hundred years old. Um, that it was written. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, almost a hundred years I think. Um, and so I'm, this will come with the course and the uh, we'll then move on to Anaximander and his fragment a translation of which is by Friedrich Nietzsche which is the following whence things have their origin there they must also pass away according to necessity for they must pay penalty and be judged for their injustice according to the ordinance of time now what this translation um, kind of doesn't really consider is, however, is the notion of the aperon, the infinite, the boundless, the limitless, which figures prominently in in Anaximander. The aperon is um, that which that which has no bounds, which has no limits and that which we on on the rich walk of which the human being walks perhaps we could say so this will be the first seminar on those two thinkers who were able to think through the most um abstract um and then we'll move over to parmenides who is the thinker of being the first response to being and it's with Parmenides that the presupposition of all of Western philosophy was articulated first, and that is the unity of being and thought. That being, and that it's necessary to see this, that there's a unity between being and thinking. This will only be not questioned, but critiqued, and in a sense, then it's attempted to argue for it by Immanuel Kant 2000 years later and the rest of it uh, is not just a, an interesting aspect of history of the history of philosophy but this is where um, the thinking arrives in a new place for itself with the critique of Kant and the subsequent attempt to provide again a basis so that being and thinking do come together again and are unified. As some of you might know it's Heidegger also goes through in his last lecture course what is called thinking was heißt denken. He goes through the belonging together of being and thinking, trying to think they are not unity but they are belonging together in a non-dialectical way as still Hegel had attempted to show the unity of being and thought in a dialectical manner. Now the third seminar will be on Empedocles, as I mentioned before, who is someone who is sometimes considered to be mediating between Parmenides and Heraclitus. So this is, broadly speaking, between monism and pluralism, but we're not really going to use these kinds of isms. This is just a first way of introducing this. Um, for Empedocles, love and strife are the primal forces. Um, and the primal force of the universe, he speaks of the four elements. By the way, Hölderlin wrote a tragic play or a tr long tragic poem on Empedocles. And the cosmos for Empedocles is a fourfold structure. There's a, the ether, sometimes translated as air, there's fire, there's water, there's earth. And they come together and burst apart through the forces of strife and love. And against the distrust of the senses of Hermenides, as some of you may know, Hermenides distrusts the senses. The senses are only lead us to doxa, to mere opinion, to seeming. It is only through thinking that we arrive at true being and its uh, true existence. He does not really, so Empedocles does not distrust the senses as such, but he allows for motion, which in the most extreme interpretation 
or following of Parmenides is no longer possible. There's no movement. And so this movement uh, obviously is, is allowed through the forces of of uh, love and strife. But there is a self-sameness. There is still an identity. There is a, something that perseveres throughout through the foundational elements. So we will read some important passages of the poem that we still have. It's in mostly a, a, a poem that we have from um, Empedocles. So we'll read fragments of this, which we'll find in Burnett's um, book. And he, I've chosen that we finish on Heraclitus, even though Empedocles is technically someone who mediates between the two and, and comes later than Heraclitus, because I think that we find in Heraclitus one of the most, not to sound too much like a cliche, but he's an extremely important thinker, I think, for our time. Because he, he tries to think through and reconcile opposites in the world. I've mentioned um, German idealism before. One could almost say that the entirety of um, the entirety of uh, of of German idealism and also the German Romantic movement is trying to overcome or reconcile opposites in the world. So, what do I mean by this? The Schlegel brothers, who were with the spare hats of literary irony, thought to reconcile opposites in the world through irony. For Hegel, through dialectics. For Schiller, through poetry. Similar for Hölderlin. And Nietzsche is also interesting. You see, Nietzsche is trying to go beyond opposites. He's after German idealism, obviously, but he's trying to go beyond it. Now, Heidegger is also someone through the notion of his notion of equi primordiality, simultaneity, gleichzeitigkeit, gleich ursprünglichkeit, try to think opposites in the world. And so they're all trying to articulate, we could say, that all is one and one is all. That there is a, a, di a, a world of diversity which still, however, can find coherence and does not just leap into mere chaos. Chaos, by the way, is also an ancient Greek word. Chaos means something like a yawning abyss. Um, and very often in in ancient Greek, or what we could consider ancient Greek, myths of origin of Genesis foretell the story that it, that the world emerges or is generated from out of the abyss. I'm just pulling out my um, Heraclitus book. So again, also with Heraclitus, we will read assorted fragments, not all of them. We'll read, for example, what's considered the first fragment um, on Logos, that we are always already listening, or he at least potentially hearing Logos, but we're not listening to Logos and what this might mean. But also look at this um, very strange sounding um, fragment. That which is bursting apart or standing apart is coming together, and out of that which is most dissonant the most beautiful harmony arises. But of course also we will read that one is many and many is one. Another important uh, fragment is on is simply three words, physis gryptis die file, which we can tentatively translate as nature likes to hide herself, but there's more to it uh, than just nature hiding herself. We'll get into this in the course. And of course also the pur aeson, the ever living fire. Now, and for Heraclitus, this is no longer a force as it may still be for, or it may be for Empedocles who comes after him, but there's something more profound here going on as well that the ever living fire um, in its ways is that which gives rise or regulates the cosmos. And of course, also the notion that polymos panton pateristin, that war is the father of everything. I think that we find in Heraclitus the foundation for German idealism. But we will also, I think, be able to see why Heraclitus is, I would think, the most important thinker for for this our time, 
where philosophy is moving um, into its own end state and becomes sterile, a sort of uh, an enterprise of applying isms to certain um, to certain movements and certain histories, so-called, and there's a certain freedom perhaps that we'll find with Heraclitus in this. A few things that we'll be able to see thanks to him and also be able to think in terms of what it means that there's a world of opposites and how to reconcile opposites and how to grapple with the well, primordial war that perhaps is raging always in the cosmos. So I'm really looking forward to this course. It's going to be four seminars and the way it's structured is that we meet over Zoom. It's capped at around 15 people, which gives us the opportunity to have really focused group discussions. Every seminar starts off with, there will be handouts for every single seminar for a couple of pages and assorted recommended readings for the week. And every seminar will start with a 15, 20 minute lecture by me on the topic. And then we'll have, as I said, focus group discussions. You'll get access to my Halkion Guild members forum, not just for the time of the course, but also extended for as long as you wish to be a part of it. And you can use this forum to join reading groups and get in touch with others. There's a reading group on Heidegger, there's reading groups on, I think, uh, Henri Corbin. Uh, there was one on Iqbal, one on Nishida before. So there's always a good place to meet others who are interested in philosophy, all kind, all types of philosophy, and start reading groups and then continue the dialogue also on the forum and by meeting other people. There will be, as I said, four seminars and an, an additional fifth seminar where you can present a talk yourself. We'll figure out when exactly. We'll do that probably a couple of weeks after the last seminar, which will be on the last weekend of February. So we'll meet 6th of February and then every consecutive Saturday until the last weekend of February. And if you want to find out course fees and also the syllabus, follow the link just below and fill in the form on my website. I'll send you the syllabus then um, to the email address that you leave there. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to this course. I have, I think, about eight or nine people now enrolled so far. So just room for five, six, seven more, depending. And if you have any questions, you can use the form as well, just to send me a question, ask me anything on the course, have a look at the syllabus, and then you can still decide whether you want to go or not. Uh, if you sign up now, we'll actually meet for what we do at Halkion is movie nights. We watch documentaries together. We'll watch a Plato documentary. Um, next Sunday and Plato on Plato and Pythagoras which will be a good um, sort of a introduction to the course to February and yeah I'm just uh, looking forward to it and hope to see you there any questions just let me know thank you very much